People power in Puerto Rico. This week, delegations from two New York churches have been finding out what it takes to rebuild on the island. And Amy Tidd of National Nurses United talks about the legislation that would force Washington to act. All that and I catch up with San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz and hear who is helping and who isn't. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. The six-month anniversary of Hurricane Maria devastating the island of Puerto Rico came and went this past March. The situation on the ground is, by all accounts, except for the president's, dire. While the lights have come back on for most, 8% of electrical customers are still waiting. The conversation in media other than this seems to be shifting to the social crises that are now emerging on the island. But for many, basic supplies, services, and medical care are still nowhere in sight. And let's not forget that some people are pushing to privatize everything from education to the power grid as we speak. In the massive gaps left by our official government response, individuals, communities, and organizations are stepping in. I recently had a chance to talk with San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz. She has a lot to say about what aid has come through and what hasn't. A few people who are stepping up are my guests, Edna Benitez and Damaris Whitaker, are from the Middle Collegiate and Fort Washington Collegiate Churches, respectively. They've been organizing trips to help bring essential supplies to parts of Puerto Rico since the hurricane hit. Amy Tidd is also joining us with National Nurses United. She's been to Puerto Rico on two different delegations since the hurricane. She's joining us from Bangor, Maine. Amy, glad to have you. Glad to be here. Thank you. Let's start with the big picture, um, and it is a big picture. Damaris, let's hear from you. What is the situation right now at six months in plus? What are people facing? They are facing a very slow recovery process. They're facing lack of power or consistent power. They're facing lack of clean water and consistent water service. They're facing a very abbreviated school day for their children. Uh, the children are still going to school half a day. They're facing the, the, the university students, for example, who have began their first year, like my nephew, Jadiel, they're facing going to school in the morning or going to the University of Puerto Rico in San Juan and then returning to a house without lights and without appropriate water, with, without the infrastructure that he needs for him to succeed. We're facing lack of economic development um, efforts and a leadership that can take the island forward in an effective way. Edna, to you, you've been now on two trips? Correct. Your church, and I'm a member, has a real relationship with the community that, that you're visiting. Can you talk about how you, as it were, picked that community and, and the nature of that community specifically? Sure, um, whether they picked us or we picked them <laughs> is still a question, but, but basically through our connection with, uh, with a very small, um, grassroots organization called Proyecto Matria that Damaris was a part of. We connected to this small town uh, right in the center of Puerto Rico and being in the middle we felt that that was an appropriate place to be in the middle of Puerto Rico where it's mountainous and it's basically a community where it's forgotten. It was forgotten before the hurricane and now it's just completely you know yeah. off the map. They really don't even appear in Google or had their uh, census counted or anything like that. So, we so when we're talking about these numbers, 8% not getting electricity or water? Oh, they have nothing. They have, they, have, they have some water and they have no electricity, nor electricity in the near future for them. And those numbers just leave them out? They leave them out, they're not counted. Actually, they're nicknamed Los Olvidados, which means the forgotten one. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, uh, as uh, you know, in our, Resilient with Brazilian power was able to install one solar panel. So we hope to install a particular solar panels in the community where they can have some electricity and also uh, uh, we're looking to form 
a, a, a home where I, it, it will be a community hub that's, that's, that's self-sustained yeah. with uh, solar power. And, and I mean, just before we go further into what people are doing and rebuilding and rebuilding different, and I want to bring Amy in, just from the two of you, you're being very polite. <laughs> um, but I can only imagine you're raging. I mean, you go, you see what's going on, you come back, you see the conversation. Absolutely. You're not like the Roman Catholic Church. It's not the Vatican That's sending right. support. This is fairly small institutions, with all due respect. That's right. Mm -hmm. Doing what Washington isn't, what the UN well, doesn't seem to be doing. That's right. So we are completely uh, enraged and appalled. And we, what we're declaring this to be is the biggest injustice that this country, the United States, have committed in recent years. For me, what's happening in Puerto Rico is a new day or a contemporary day lynching tree. Mm. Um, we are seeing the citizens of Puerto Rico's rights being just dismantled in front of our eyes. We do not recognize the inherent value of Puerto Ricans, so we don't count their lives correctly. The report that we heard on March 20th, that 64 lives were lost after Hurricane Maria, it is so off. I mean, we more than a thousand lives were lost and so many others consequently because of the conditions have been lost since then. We feel, Puerto Ricans, Damaris Whitaker, who is a Puerto Rican for, from Umagao, feel that my body, yeah. in, this, in this body, my, my value is not seen in this country. Never mind those who are in the island of Puerto Rico, olvidados that are constantly told the light will, will come on or the power will be restored by Tuesday or March. And here we are. And I mean, even the elected officials, I had an opportunity to speak with the mayor of Orocovis, who did not have a concrete answer as to when his town was going to have power. And he just said to me, the governor is telling us, 95% of the island will have power by March. And we were there on at, at the end of February, and I kept saying, you don't have the infrastructure in the mountain for that to be possible for you. So we are enraged. This is an injustice. We're suffering from righteous indignation. <laughs> Anything you want to add to that, Edna? Well, well, and also, um, when we want to do something, we just continuously find, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, well, I was saying what grassroots organization are making a difference. We wanted to install two solar power mm -hmm. uh, panel on a public schools. We were hit about, no, you can't. We need permissions from three organizations in order for that to happen. And the political systems there is, I mean, if you think we're polarized here, it's completely mm -hmm. polarized mm -hmm. there, um, you know, and on steroids in the sense that two political parties might not agree. And because of that, you won't get anything done. Yeah. Let's bring Amy in, who's one of those who has been getting some things done, along with the two of you. Um, National Nurses United has been part of several delegations. There have been big delegations organized by the AFL-CIO. You've also made some trips uh, at an individual level, and I know nurses have been going to and fro even um, when they've been making it on their own dime. Uh, Amy, tell me a little bit about why you signed up to go from Bangor, Maine to, to Puerto Rico, what you found there, and, and how many times you've gone back. Um, well, I had signed up with um, Registered Nurse Response Network, which is powered by NNU prior to the hurricane, um, because I had known several people that had been on uh, trips to Haiti and other places after disasters, and so I wanted to be on the call list um, if ever needed. And uh, what really prompted all of us to go this last time um, was the call from uh, the mayor of San Juan, um, and we were all called to action. Of course, there was a media blackout uh, prior to her getting on TV and just telling us what was really mm -hmm. going on. Um, and so if you, if you know NNU, uh, you know that uh, if, if there's a call, if there's a need, we'll be there. And we won't let anything stand in our way. I have to say, I mean, I was going to tell you this off camera, but I'll tell you it right now. When I met the mayor, um, I happened to be introducing her to somebody who worked with NNU, a, a white guy, not a nurse, but he works with them in the office. She embraced him in a tearful embrace that I think went on for a good six minutes. So heart, so moved is she still by what NNU as an organization um, has done. And she said, you also looked after me. Your nurses looked after me, my health. Um, it was a very, very touching moment. But seriously, there's a lot of um, trauma there, clearly, not just in the mayor, but throughout. 
there's health and there's mental health. What, what did you find? We found health issues everywhere. Um, chronic health issues, like you would expect of an aging population, a lot of heart failure, a lot of diabetes, that are typically uh, very well-managed conditions under normal circumstances. Um, but when you wipe out the health care infrastructure um, and power in and of itself, um, folks that have diabetes don't have a cool enough place to store insulin for mm -hmm. its people. Um, just this cascade of effects that happens from, you know, uh, the obvious, you know, when you when we landed on October 4th at the San Juan airport, um, it looked like a bomb went off, mm -hmm. quite frankly. I had never seen anything like that. It didn't look like a, a post-hurricane uh, situation, right down to um, the things that we all take for granted every day. Um, there was no clean drinking water source, as we soon found out uh, days after that we got there. We thought our drinking water was okay, um, and we found out quite quickly that it was not okay, mm. even in the city of San Juan. Um, so uh, in the most recent trip that I went on, um, of course, this is months after I went in January, uh, the recovery efforts are apparent. Um, the main difference I did see was that there was a lot of work being done as far as you could see line workers everywhere. Uh, but there's still just a lot of fear um, and fear in the communities regarding privatization, um, regarding, uh, you know, PROMISA and what, what are they going to do um, as you know, people that aren't even from there and know nothing about the island are making decisions for them. Yeah, that's and the appointed no very colonial board that is making decisions about how to deal with the debt and repayment and so on. Um, Amy, before we let you go, just very quickly, I know that NNU has a legislative response to all this. Um, we don't just want self-help, we need government response. Um, what is NNU calling for? And you met with some people, the organization met with some people on the Hill not long ago. Yes, um, Kathy Kennedy, who was a leader of our first appointment, um, went along with many of the other nurses that were on the first appointment to talk to members of Congress, including Bernie Sanders, to make recommendations as to what needs to be done. Um, and the package that Bernie Sanders put together uh, is was requesting over $146 billion. And we know that just a tiny, tiny fraction of that has been apportioned to be split among Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are just really pushing on the legislators mm -hmm. and trying to remind them that you know the voting season is coming up. And we're going to remember your response yeah. to this, this situation. We'll remember. Edna Damaris, what are you calling for? Is there a legislative piece of your project? And what is it that is giving you the most kind of encouragement and inspiration right now in terms of this project? In, in terms of uh, the, our call for legislative movement, uh, I think that we need to call for the debt of Puerto Rico to be restructured or forgiven. We need to dismantle the Jones Act permanently. We need to focus on rebuilding more homes and putting str strategies and initiatives on the ground that would bring forth more economic development and empowerment in, in the communities so that they can become more self-sustaining. Yeah. And we have to hold the elected officials in the island accountable. When we hear two days ago, in this, in this week of anniversary of this tragedy, that the head of the AEE, which is the Agencia of Energia Electrica, the, electrical, uh, the um, agency for electric power, being paid half a million dollars at a time of crisis, I'm, we're calling for accountability. And what can people do, Edna? What do you want people to be doing? I think people should vote. <laughs> people that can vote should vote. We have a very low turnout of Puerto Ricans that are in the, in the mainland that do not vote. In Puerto Rico, 85, over 85% 80 of people vote when it comes time for, for, for their elections. But when they come to the states, they do not vote. They feel that there's no need for them to vote. Mm -hmm. So I think they should be, uh, they should empower themselves and vote. And what else? Between now and November, anything else? Well, continuous uh, supporting organizations that are grassroots, like ours, like uh, middlechurch.org, like fortwashingtonchurch.org that are doing grassroots organization. And 100% of the proceeds, we are, we, you can make us accountable. We are going. We are bringing the stuff to ourselves. We eliminated the middle ground. We are working through the, the cracks and the bureaucracies and making a difference. Why am I not surprised? Thank you both, all of you. Um, Amy, 
and Damaris, thank, thank you, for you for being with us. us. Thank you for having us. We'll continue to cover this story, and you can find out more about the debt that was mentioned earlier, PROMESA, and also the Jones Act at our website. Thanks. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. We're still here at the Progressive Caucus Center Strategy Summit in Baltimore, Maryland, with a very special guest. Mayor Carmen Yulene Cruz from San Juan, Puerto Rico is with us. You're familiar with her on television in the days after the storms, Maria especially, hit the island. The situation there is still terribly dire, more than six months after the storm. So let's start with that. Mayor Yulene, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's hear the bad news first. It's been six months. It's been six months. People often ask, how are you doing? And you know, you want to answer with a certain sense of hope and you want to say we're doing fine but we're not doing fine every two to three weeks there's a total power outage we're about 800,000 to a million people all of a sudden go back to square one 500,000 people are estimated to have left all of Puerto Rico and come into the United States and this is horrible uh, suicide rates have increased by 55 percent suicide rates in Puerto Rico have increased by 55%. What does that look like on the ground? What does that mean? People lose hope, people lose faith, people um, see family members that need electricity to literally breathe and uh, they have to, it, it takes a, a toll on having to run a generator, a small generator, uh, the noise, the smell, um, the the impotence of knowing uh, nobody nobody knows you know the governor says one thing the Army Corps of Engineers says another thing uh, they are at odds with each other and there's a there's an old uh, Hindu phrase that says when elephants fight the grass is the only one that loses it's the people that don't have the information uh, that we have FEMA was not good uh, at the beginning. They, they have a very good diesel program, which runs perfectly. But, you know, they changed the rules. Uh, first of all, it was like, you give us a projection and we'll give you half of it. Then it was, well, give us a projection and we'll give you half of it, but only if it's up to a million dollars. So cities like San Juan, where we uh, put $21 million towards being ready, as ready as you can be, uh, we're still owed $11.2 million. And that may not be a lot of money, but we haven't been able to do right by our employees and, and pay them the overtime uh, and also uh, pay them uh, their, their Christmas bonus because the money that we had in store for that, we had to use towards uh, ensuring that we had enough medicine and food and water. Um, so, so things are very touch and go. Americans may think, because their heart is, has been so, <coughs> you know, as bad as President Trump has been, the American people have been um, generous and brave. I started getting envelopes with a dollar bill from a kid in Ohio or five dollars from people in Harvey, um, AFL-CIO workers from all different unions in the United States, including SEIU. 320 of them went to Puerto Rico for two weeks. We, we um, hosted them in San Juan. They slept in cots and used their vacation and their comp time in order to be there and help not only people in San Juan, but in 34 different uh, communities outside of San Juan. Uh, and, and it was unthinkable that they could get to places where the U.S. government was saying, we have logistical issues and we can't access. You know, you have a guy, a guy that went, or a couple of guys that went up to the moon um, so how, how, how hard can the logistics be in an in, in a island 100 miles long and 35 miles wide? So how do we turn this moment into a, or how are you turning it, are you turning it into a new direction, a, a place of power? Is there, is there, in a sense, there's something to be said for getting out of denial. You, you said on the speech, it's like we can no longer hide behind our pina coladas and our beautiful beaches. Yeah. And, and you said, we cannot be sacrificing health for wealth. We got to put health before wealth. We got to put education before discrimination. We got to put love before hate. And they seem like simple terms. 
you know, it's like common sense, which is the least common of the senses sometimes. But somehow the human spirit overcomes. But we don't want to just overcome. We want to not have people in uh, this we, situation. No, we, we don't. <laughs> I, I, I say we don't want to survive. We want to thrive. Right? How do we do that? So first of all, you have to start looking at life from every other point of view uh, besides your own. That, that's number one. Number two, you, you, you do like the Marines. You improvise, you adapt, you overcome. You know that the failure is not an option. Mm -hmm. And you know that you have to transform and change rather than rebuild and reconstruct. So we look at the way things were and we change it and, and we make it better. It's not gonna be perfect. So you don't let perfection get in the way of action. Do you have time? I mean, you would like to start that you would like to have the grid be a different kind of grid. You would like to have the economy be different. Do, yeah. you have, do you have time to do that kind of transformation, not just survival? We have to fix the plane while it's flying. We have to do what, uh, Houston, we have a problem. What was it, Apollo 13? Somebody was on the ground saying, give me everything they have to work with, and you know, I'm gonna make it happen, right? So, so we have to do both things. We, we have to walk forward, but we have to think way in advance. Uh, and, and that's not difficult, you know. Humankind have done it all, all throughout history. So give us an example. You've got the privatizers chomping at the bit to privatize your grid, to, to buy up your schools, turn them from public to charter. And we have the central government helping them do that. The central government of Puerto Rico is helping them do that. Why? Because they're putting forward an, an agenda that is not progressive because he's using the pain for somebody else's gain. And, and we have to make sure that we show a different way and then we show that things work in a different way and in a different realm and in a different environment and that we, we start rebuilding homes but making sure that they are more stable than they were before. 83 days before hurricane season begins and we have about 500,000 homes in Puerto Rico that need total transformation. So it's very difficult. You don't give up. You don't give up. You, every day you make sure you take a step forward and no step backwards. But on the question of what you're up against, the privatization of the grid especially, talk about the motivations of those who want to take over the electrical system of Puerto Rico. One would think that profit is, is one of it, but, but I, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I think it's more of a control. Essential services everywhere in the world are about access to uh, a platform for equality, which is why I oppose privatization of essential services. In fact, the United Nations has said that access to essential services is critical to human rights. So we're talking about our human rights crises, about our human rights issues. Um, and it's just a feeding frenzy, and, and we have to stop it. And how do you stop it? You come to forums like this, and you make sure that you engage people. You make sure that you tell the good people of the United States that, uh, you, you know, don't, don't, don't look at everything they show you and think it's the right way. Um, make sure that you do what you do best and that you get well informed. We continue to inform people, but most Americans, oh, I saw it in the room when I said $4.9 billion of loan, we haven't gotten one cent. People started looking at themselves. You know, you think that a loan that was approved late November, early December, we would have gotten the money we need it now, right? Mm -mm. And now they're asking us to use some of that money to pay hedge funds and to pay the debt. So I'm thankful to Nidia Velasquez and the other 49 other humans that have seen that uh, somebody's pain cannot be somebody else's gain and have said not one cent of that should go to uh, making payments to the hedge funds. Uh, you know, not on, not on our watch. We have to make sure that the right thing is done and the right thing cannot be a worse devastation than Maria, which would be to take away our ability to think that we deserve to be treated with respect. The 
point that you made about the price of electricity, the fees that Puerto Ricans are used to pay. Oh, that, that, the governor actually said that on February 15th in New York City. Somebody asked him, Governor, um, why would anybody want to invest? And he said, oh, because Puerto Ricans, and I'm paraphrasing, are used to paying such a high cost for energy that basically you could lower it but not share that with the Puerto Rican people and make a killing. Well, with friends like that, we don't need any enemies, do we? So what can people do to help you now? If, if you needed the emergency relief of people feeding and caring and, and, and getting people to safety, what's the equivalent with respect to emergency relief from the privatizers? We're coming to a midterm election. Um, 27 million Latinos did not vote. Yikes, you know, get off your couch and vote, right? Register, organize, and vote. And make sure that the real America is shown in those midterm elections. And if push comes to shove, and if the only thing that happens is that we pull the rug from under President Trump so that he doesn't have all the power, let's do it. Let's dare to be fearless and change the world. You got it. Thank you so much, Mayor Yulene Cruz. We'll have more information about what you can do and how you can connect with this work at our website. That's lauraflanders.org. Thanks. Mm -hmm.